So if blockchain is the best thing since sliced bread, where will it be adopted fulsomely first and when? Here to tell us is fintech expert Joe Duncan. Uh, welcome back, Joe. We're so glad to have you uh, again. It was great to have you last time, and we're happy that you're here now. When we last had you on the show a few weeks ago, we left it that uh, blockchain is at the stage of adoption where many enterprises may start to embrace it. Uh, so what are the biggest obstacles for this to happen? Hi, Bart. Uh, thanks. It's good to be back. The, um the main issue is scalability, so let's define that as transactions per second. Um, right now, Ethereum and Bitcoin can process about seven transactions per second. Uh, that compares to the gold standard of payment networks like Visa and MasterCard that routinely do 2,000 a second and then during peak holiday seasons can get over 50,000 a second. So the gap sounds large. However, at least in test environments, you already have blockchain scaling to those levels and beyond. Uh, both of the Bitcoin forks, BCH and BSV, for example. Ethereum is going through an upgrade later this month, which will also en enhance its scalability. Uh, there, are, there are several alternatives and projects uh, that are going to upgrade the scalability of blockchains. Really too many to mention it at this point. So um, there is actually some resistance within the blockchain community itself. About there, there's an there's a argument that says that uh, decentralization and scalability are, are at odds with each other. I find this largely a philosophical argument. Uh, the reasoning is uh, that the, the people take that stand uh, make is that um, everybody who's, who's using it for payment should also be a validator. In Bitcoin, the validators are miners. Well, the, the blockchains we've talked about, that was never the case past the first few blocks that were created. In other words, the pace of uh, people using it for payments exceeded that of, of the miners that were using it. So in, in, um, the good thing is, as soon as that's out of this, the faster it's out of the system, the better. And the good thing is that it will be competed away. Because now there are blockchains that can scale to those levels. And uh, they're the ones that are going to get traction with end users. Uh, in terms of enterprises yeah. or, or go, go ahead, Joe. Uh, are going to get it first, I, I think, well, ultimately the winners in this are going to be the consumers. I'm speaking in the US. And that's the way it should be. Everybody should be happy about that. So bank customers will have a service that is um, more flexible, they can use it 24 7 in real time. It'll be cheaper. Cross border transactions will take minutes, not days. Uh, they will cost pennies, not dollars. And overall, monthly account maintenance fees, uh, which can be in excess of $30, will drop in the single digits. When banks use it as the back end database for their um, uh, settlement architecture and also uh, their audit function. So when, you know, when banks auditors and the regulators are working off the same distributed ledger that's updating in real time, well, that'll cut the, the cost dramatically. Um, I would look for, in terms of which banks, I would look for the middle tier banks first uh, the, as being the first adopters. Uh, the large players in the space actually, actually have a, uh, a disincentive to see it happen right away because they're the ones who have figured out how to make money given the inefficiencies of uh, centralized databases that need to talk to each other. For example, I talked about a cross-border wire transaction. Well, right now, let's say that somebody sends a cross-border wire transaction to somebody overseas. As soon as the um, sender hits submit, those proceeds are out of her account. Well, where are they in the five days it takes for it to show up in the receiver's account? They're on the bank's balance sheet somewhere earning interest, and that's called float, as you know. So the, the large actors in the system don't have an incentive to see that leave anytime soon. It, it's good quality income for them. So I would look for the middle tier players that use decentralized ledgers to work around them. And I would think maybe the, the large money center banks will be the last ones to adopt it. Um, I think the, the last thing you want to. So, so, so. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Bert. Go ahead, yeah, go right ahead. Oh, I think the, the last thing no, uh, we, you, you, we want to discuss uh, was uh, timing. When do I see it uh, happening, right? All these. Uh, uh, benefits for the consumer as well. Uh, I'm going to say, I'm gonna, uh, excuse me, I'm going to say it's uh, t uh, two years, uh, and I'm going to uh, go at that from two angles. Uh, one is a little more solid way of thinking about it, more traditional, in that um, you know it, it, banks are perfectly positioned to to adopt blockchain technology. Uh, like I said, there are 94% of the households in the U.S. Most people have a bank account. They have the internal resources both technical and financial, to adopt it. And then it becomes a seamless rollout to the consumers. Consumers won't even know it's blockchain, nor, nor will they care it's blockchain. They'll, they'll just see a service Joe, so we're going to look at two, we're going to look at two years from. So he brings up some great points. What I want to discuss is the fact that banks have the conflict of interest, because I see this uh, with the banks I bank with. Uh, two of the main banks I bank with, Wells Fargo and Bank of America, have not increased their interest rate. 
and I was forced, and I recommend everyone to do this, is I went to Barclays Bank and opened up an online saving account that was paying me almost 2.2% uh, interest. Um, and unfortunately, the, the main banks I use, Bank of America and Wells Fargo, they don't even give you 0.1% interest because uh, there's no incentive for them. They have so many people that just leave their money there and get zero. And that's the whole idea of cryptocurrency is to not allow this and force banks to become more and more efficient and not to be able to profit off of our money and give us nothing in return. So uh, I'm a huge crypto enthusiast. And it is unfortunate that these large banks uh, have no incentive and continue to profit off of our deposits, yet refuse to give any kind of interest or move very, very slowly compared to other online banks. But that's just the, na the way the nature of the business is. But let me know your thoughts on this, and I will talk to you guys soon.